In this chapter, we're going to talk about where to physically mount our panels and how to do that. If you have a completely unobstructed view to the south, that's fantastic, but that's very rare. Most of us have to deal with trees. So let's take a look at what you have to consider when you're figuring out where and how to mount your panels. So when you analyze your site for where you're going to put your solar panel array, of course, we have criteria. The first is maximum southern exposure to the sun. You need at least four hours of full sun every day on those panels. I'm not talking shaded, partially shaded branches in the way. Panels only put out their maximum power when they're in direct unobstructed sunlight. And the more hours you have of that, the more power you're going to get out of the array and the more value the system's going to have. The second is that it's mechanically secure. It can't be on anything that's moving, not a tree, anything like that that actually vibrates or moves around because the connections may come loose. The third is you have to have access for servicing because you may need to go up and clean off the panels once in a while, check the connections, just normal observation and servicing. And the fourth is that they are safe from theft. Don't put them in a place where they easily can be unbolted and carted off. So here is how the sun moves across the sky. You'll notice that the lowest arc is December 21st, and that's the shortest day of the year. And it's in the northern hemisphere, it's going to go from the left to the right, which is east to west. At that lowest angle, that angle is about what your latitude is above the horizon. So here in Arkansas, that's 34 degrees. On December 21st, the sun will peak out at its highest point at about 34 degrees above the horizon and then start to go down again. By the equinoxes, March 21st and September 21st, halfway between June 21st, that highest point in the sky the sun will be, and the lowest, those two equinoxes, March and September, it's going to add about 23 and a half degrees to that angle and raise up and then by June 21st the point at the sun's the highest in the sky it's going to add 47 degrees to that coming up to around 80 degrees or more so from left to right east to west and from the lowest point to the highest point that's the swath across the sky that we're interested in having the panels be able to clearly see we want the panels to be 90 degrees to the sun, if at all possible, because at that angle, they're going to be generating the most amount of power. We know we can mount them facing south, but with the seasonal change in elevation of the sun, we're going to need to be able to tilt them back and forward so that we can get as close to 90 degrees perpendicular to the sun to maximize our output. If I want to find out where the sun is in my area for my location, I need three things. First, I need a bubble level. I'm using a small one here. Next thing I need is a child's school protractor. And the third thing I need is a compass. I'm using a little bubble compass here. Very simple. First thing you do is find due south. And there may be a little bit of magnetic correction. Check the magnetic correction maps for true north and magnetic north in your area. In Arkansas, we're about spot on. You might have to add a little bit of degrees either way there. So you find exact south. Then you go ahead and line up your bubble level nice and level pointing south, and then you put your protractor right on top of it, like so. And for the low point in the sky, that would be December 21st, it's going to be about your latitude. That's about 34 degrees here in Arkansas. So I can look right on the protractor and see where 34 degrees is, and I'll know that the sun's going to arc from east to west at about that level at the low point in the sky. Then for the two equinoxes in September and March 21st, I add 23.5 degrees, which is really the tilt of the Earth's axis, and look on there and find, okay, those are the two midpoints. Then a full 47 degrees can be added to that low point for your June 21st high point in the sky midsummer reading, pretty much overhead in most of the US. And with a slight variation from that, that's going to give you the exact swath across the sky that your panels need to be able to see clearly. And here's another little nice device. Oh, for 50 cents, you can take a piece of dowel and a piece of 2x4 drill a hole in the middle and go ahead and stick a little piece of dowel in it and what you can do with this is tell when your panels are exactly 90 degrees or perpendicular to the sun just by moving it like this it's a really easy way to see what the angle directly at the sun might be. So what are the optimum angles to adjust your array if you adjust say two, three, or four times a year? And the more you do adjust the more you will be on angle to the sun and gather more energy. 
I've made a chart for you here that shows you if you do adjust it two, three, or four times, here are the approximate dates and the angles to adjust your array to. You can see that L being your latitude, you add a certain amount of degrees. And of course, the more you do adjust it, during the year, the more energy you're going to capture. We're not talking about a whole lot more. We're just talking about squeezing a little bit more out of the system. So the more proactive you are, the more power you can get out of your system. You can freeze the video, write the dates down, and make a little chart that you can put as part of your maintenance schedule. What about if you're going to put panels on the roof with a fixed tilt angle? What's the best angle? Well, of course, you're going to face due south with a maximum of 20 degrees off from left to right if the house is not perfectly facing south. Then align the tilt to 10 degrees higher than your latitude. And this is for locations in the USA between north 30 and north 40 latitudes, most of the central USA. This alignment favors the winter sun because your electrical needs are generally higher in the winter. You're in the house for longer periods using lighting and everything else. And the winter sun is weaker from atmospheric light drop. The sun has to go through more atmosphere for parts of the day to get to you. So you're not going to have as much energy there. So if you favor the winter a little bit, you'll certainly get enough power during the summertime. But you should sort of give a little bit of an edge to the winter sun. So how do you make that call, that final decision as to where the array is going to go? Remember that number one, maximum full sun is paramount over all other criteria. So think about that first. Number two, get it as close as you can to the battery and equipment box because the further it is, like more than 75 or 100 feet, you're going to have to pay for larger diameter copper wire. It's expensive and it's an upfront outlay, but you can do it if you have to get those sun hours. So you're never going to get all the hours you can get if you have trees to deal with. Just shoot for six hours of full sun in the winter and the rest of the year will be even better. Here's something that helps you. Modern photovoltaic panels have special surfaces on their glass to maximize energy production from the sunlight that's not perfectly 90 degrees from the panel. It means your panels will make pretty good power even when the sun's not exactly 90 degrees to them. First, let's take a look at a commercially produced steel mounting frame. And here are Zomeworks professional installation panel mounts. We're putting these together for this installation over here. You can see that basically it's an H-frame out of tubular quarter-inch metal right here. In the pattern of an H comes down and then small square bars are inserted into that H pattern, bolted through the center, and then rails are mounted on top with these sliding rail mounts. Slide them onto those bars and then when we get our panels on there, we'll sort of walk them in and tighten everything down. Everything's pre-drilled, ready to go. If you're going to buy commercial panel mounts, mounting frames are ordered by giving the model number and the number of panels you'll be installing to the manufacturer. Remember, most times, though, it takes several weeks to get your commercially made panel frames delivered as they may need to be fabricated. These frames are made to mount on a rooftop or are made to mount on the top of steel poles. Most pole mounts are made to mount on top of Schedule 40 6-inch steel pipe. The pole is mounted so that fully one-third of it is underneath the ground. Here it is nice and straight and true, being braced up ready for concrete. Then we go ahead and put in at least a cubic yard of high-strength concrete, let it set, and our panel frame is then ready to mount on top of the pole. If you're having to mount more than one frame and more than one pole, you'll have to be sure that there's enough space between the poles that the frames do not touch each other and that when they're both mounted, they're both facing perfectly south. Commercial panel frames come with a spec sheet that specifies how much concrete will be needed for any given height pole. You can add rebar to the concrete or you can purchase some of the new fiber added high strength concrete. With rooftop mounting frames, they can be as simple as a U-channel metal stock that lays flat on the roof, and clips are available to mount the panels to those rails. Now you can only use this type of roof mount if your roof angle is nearly ideal for your latitude and your sun angles. If not, you're going to gather less energy. Notice with these rooftop rail mounts, they come on a standoff provided by the manufacturer to give more space for ventilation in the back of the panels. And on the left, you can see that there are angle changing rail mounts so that you can tilt the panels up modifying that angle to the sun if necessary. You can fabricate metal panel frames from angle iron stock 
or for lighter weight, you could use aluminum stock. Pressure-treated lumber or wood is a good material as well. Remember that mechanical rigidity is mandatory. You cannot allow flex in the array mounting frame. And whatever types of mount you use, you need at least 4 to 6 inches of breathing space in between the roof and the back of the panel so that air can move and keep the panels cool. Here is the most basic type of frame you can make at home. This is made from metal or treated wood and it's for use on shallow angle roofs. In other words, if you laid the panels on the roof flat, they would not be at the right angle. Or on the ground, if you are completely unobstructed, you have no trees, you're out in the desert, and you can mount it just a few inches off the ground for drainage. So you'll see you're making your frame with enough space left to right and top to bottom and vertical struts to mount your panels on. Your panels themselves will dictate this exact size of the frame. Notice in the corners I have little diagonals for rigidifying the frame. And the two bottom legs have several holes put in them so that your angle arms coming down from the frame can be adjusted seasonally when the sun changes. If this frame is laying directly on the ground, I do suggest that you use pressure treated lumber under those bottom legs if they are metal. For holding the frame solid, you need to have vertical stakes going into the ground to mount the two bottom legs in. In a temporary installation, you could even use cinder blocks or sandbags. Here's a frame like that that I constructed down in Texas where I had to use that back side of the roof and to get the angle, I was going to need an adjustable frame. The frames were then anchored onto the roof using metal L brackets which were then water sealed. And here's one we just finished where we made a metal mounting frame and put it right onto a trailer for a portable solar power station. Only once your panels are securely mounted on your frames can you start to wire them together. Here's a classic wood mounting frame. This would be for two, four, or six panels on a mount that's near the ground but lifted up, oh, between four and 12 feet. And we're using all wood construction. You construct your frame on the ground and you see the two by fours that are in the center of the frame, those would be spaced out so that they can fit on the top of the poles with a half inch axle through it or nut and bolt. Now I'm using 4x4 four four for say two panels or 4x6 main poles for four panels you go even up one more size if you're going six panels and notice on the bottom of the frame are two 2x4s two coming out at a diagonal because several holes are drilled in these diagonal 2x4 pieces you can adjust the frames angle seasonally for optimum solar gain. Now let's take a look at how I put together one such frame. This frame is custom made for four panels. The spacings are set so that the edges of the panels lap right over on those vertical 2x4s for mounting. I'm going to use stainless steel mounting hardware in this case. The corners of the frame are rigidified by using these diagonal inset pieces and the entire frame is screwed together using outdoor decking screws. A thing you need to remember is that you have to measure, say from the far right corner all the way down to this corner and then from the far left corner over to this corner and be sure that they're identical that way you know the frame is straight and true. Notice that on the left and right of this panel there are built ups, what I call built ups, and these are multiple 2x4s that are going to accept the vertical poles. In this case it was the extended version where we use 2x4s on the side of the tops of the poles. Your space between these two 2x4s needs to be perfectly spaced for the outer dimensions of the vertical wooden pole that you're going to use so that an axle can go right through there. Here's a hit point on lumber. All lumber shrinks when it dries so give your fresh lumber time to dry out before you assemble the frame so that there is minimal shrinkage afterwards. Here is a look at the diagonal brace piece. You can see that there are several holes drilled in it so you can move the panel up and down and replace that little bolt in there to adjust it for seasonal angles to the sun. Now remember with a wooden frame like this there are weight limits and it can get unwieldy if you have too many panels. So with 200 watt panels you might go two or three. With 100 watt panels you might be able to handle four or five or six in one frame. This is what I call my hybrid design and I make a traditional frame out of pressure treated lumber but then take pieces of angle iron five or six inches long I cut them and mount them in the four corners of each of the places that the panels will go in the frame and then I mount the panels right to this angle iron I align these with the holes on the panels themselves the good thing here is that if your frame was not quite dry yet your lumber is a little bit fresh you can go ahead and mount your panels in here 
and leave with a little bit of slack. In other words, just finger tighten them. And then come back a month later when the frames dried out and shrunk maybe a little bit and go ahead and cinch them down. The other thing is it's not easy to mount your panels through this type of wood. I've done it many times, but you have to go all the way through it. So this way you can just mount right to the metal over here. Just remember to mount them pretty close to the top because you um, want the panel to protrude from the top of the frame so that it doesn't create an area around the panel to collect leaves that it drains nicely and easily. Let's take a look at a diagram. The frame is made just as I showed you with the pressure treated wood, but it's made so that the panels fit inside each space with about three quarters of an inch extra around the edges. And then the angle iron mounting plates are put in the four corners. Align them with the mounting holes at the four corners of your panel and then secure it with hardware. Now in this setup, I'm going to use four 200 watt panels, but I don't want to put all four into one big frame. It'd be too unwieldy. So I'm making two two packs. Each two panels will mount in its own separate frame and have its own vertical poles to hold it up. And the two sets of two will be mounted next to each other. So let's take a look at the back here. You can see that the angle iron mounting plates are right there in the four corners of the panel corresponding to the four mounting holes which are already pre-drilled on the panel. You'll probably have eight holes totally on your panel to uh, allow you to mount it in a couple of different places. Now you'll see I'm using zinc plated hardware, easy to mount, and keep all the hardware loose while you're working on it so that you can then sort of jock everything into position because your holes won't exactly line up no matter how you try. And then you can move everything around and line the holes up and then cinch it down tight. This frame has diagonal bracing, just diagonal pieces cut with 45 degree angles at the four corners. And that gives us me mechanical uh, stability that we need and a center brace there, 2x4, so that we can mount our panels in the center. Now, I like to mount my metal angle iron plates such that the panels protrude about a half an inch or so from the front of the frame. And why is that? Because on this side here, I like to have a shorter drainage path for rain and snow to get through. Realize that you can make an inch or so spacing on the top and the bottom of the panels, but because you're using the mounting plates, the clearance on the left and right will necessarily be less. Here's about a quarter inch, such that when you mount those plates in there, the holes are going to line up for you. And that drainage channel is a little bit narrower, so if I raise the panels up, it just takes a little less effort for the water and such to get through. With these type of frames with two panels on each one, the large mounting poles actually go on the outside of the frames where you put the axles through, such that you can adjust the angle seasonally. Remember, it's a good idea to add a pull box or a disconnect at the base of the array. This is a simple air conditioner pull box, inexpensive and easy to install. It allows you to turn the array off and disconnect it from the system. It allows you to disconnect your panels by simply pulling out the bar at the top and reversing it. Connections are easy. They're marked line and neutral. Line is your plus in and out and neutral is your ground in and out. I'm running an extra bare copper wire from the ground side down to a ground rod to ground the entire panel array. You can put your feeder wire into PVC tubing and then bury it. Let's talk a little bit about lightning protection. Now your solar hardware is already very resistant to lightning. Your panels also won't be the highest thing around and lightning likes to hit the highest thing around. The charge controllers and the inverters already have MOVs in them. These are metal oxide varistors. These are lightning zapper units and they're built into the input and outputs of these devices already. So you must ground the solar panel array and that is the grounding each panel to each other. So you use little wire straps. You can use that bare copper wire, and little lugs and drill holes with nuts and, and bolts and ground each one of the panels frames to each other. And at the end, you do take a ground wire, the bare copper wire, bring it down and ground it to your ground rod at the base of the array. And you need to ground the pull boxes to ground rods. That's the same ground rod. So you're going to use uh, the four or six gauge wire, the bare copper wire, and go ahead and ground that to the ground rods at the pull box at the base of the array and at the battery box. There's a separate connection for that ground wire inside the pull box. It's a bare aluminum thing with uh, screws in it. You'll see it onto the case of the box. 
Like I mentioned, lightning is looking for the highest thing around that it can hit and discharge into it. And usually, these are trees which are higher than your house or solar panel array. Sometimes a small feeder bolt can jump onto other points around the main strike, and these may be lower in power, but also can damage equipment. But good grounding can help avoid getting hit in the first place. Here's a super heavy duty lightning arrestor module you can get, this one made by Delta, and it's got three wires, plus, minus, and ground post, and they're connected to those connections inside of your pull boxes. If you buy just one lightning arrestor, install it at the pull box on your side of your battery box and connect the three wires. If you add two of them, add the second one at the array pull box at the base of the solar panels. Here's what you're going to need to install the lightning arrestor as far as tools. Now this battery box has two systems coming into it. The one on the right, that's our pull box we're going to put the lightning arrestor in. Again, if you can install one lightning arrestor, go ahead and install it in the pull box right up at the battery box. Now these pull boxes have knockouts over here on the sides just for putting in things like this. See the size of this matches the knockout? So I'm going to take the hammer and a big screwdriver and knock this knockout out in preparation for putting this lightning arrestor in. Now looking at the inside of the pull box, now we're going to bring the lightning arrestor right in through that punch out hole. And then we're going to connect our wires up to our positive, negative, and ground. See, I've knocked out my knockout with the screwdriver and the hammer. And then I've taken the lightning arrestor, sort of just held it up there and trimmed off those wires a little bit longer than I need. I can always trim them down a little bit more before I strip off the ends. Go ahead and take off your nut and your washer and then go ahead and insert it through the knockout and this will go right into the hole handy dandy then you put your nut and washer over here and tighten them down now that we've got our nut and washer in place don't, don't over tighten it because we do have plastic threads there really not a lot of uh, pressure or anything here so you don't have to tighten it out too much. Then we're going to just take our wires and the red's going to go to your positive uh, coming in and your black's going to go to your negative coming in. So you just now you can gauge exactly how long it's going to take to get up to these screw heads and you can trim it off to the appropriate length. The green's going to go to the ground bus right there so trim it off to appropriate lengths and then we're going to take our a box cutter, a single edge razor, and trim off about a quarter inch off the end of these uh, insulated wires. Now remember, safety first. These lines are hot. Go down to the array, pull the pull box, disconnect the output of the panel array coming up into the battery box because these screw heads you're putting the wires under, they're going to have some voltage on them. So disconnect first. So let's inspect our final wiring over here. These two larger conductors are going out to the uh, charge controller. The two smaller ones on the left, one and three you might call them, are the positive coming in. It's black wire but it's marked with red tape. And this third one is the ground coming in. So we've got the green going to the ground bus over here, that little bonded strip that goes to the box. The black going to the black coming in from the panels. And the red coming in to the positive coming in from the panels. Now you could connect it to the output as well, number two and four over here. Uh, no problem because they are strapped together but be sure that you're going to do the inputs, do both to the inputs, going to do the outputs, do both of them to the outputs over there. So that's how simple it is. Ready, done. Put the cover back on and close the pull box. Here's a set of tools you're going to need in order to install the entire system. So let's review Chapter 11, Panel Mounting. Analyze your site for the best sun exposure, winter and summer. Winter is going to be your worst case, but this is your number one priority, maximum sun exposure. Determine which kind of mount you're going to use, a pole mount or a frame mount. You may be putting them on the roof, but you'll still need a frame. And then determine if you need to elevate the panels if you're putting them on poles, and by how much to get up in that nice clear sun path across the sky. Then. Order or design and fabricate frames from wood or metal. 
make your frame angle adjustable for the seasonal optimization so you can really make most energy when the sun moves across the sky. Use stainless steel hardware to attach your panels to the frame. They won't rust over time. Determine how to electrically configure your array with the series and paralleling of the panels so you'll know how many panels you're going to use. Ground your panels with copper wire to a ground rod. Add a cutoff switch at the base of your equipment as I just showed you. And route the wires safely to the battery and charge controller box and bury those wires if possible. And lastly, add lightning arresters if you're in a high lightning area or maybe you want to even if you're not and we've shown you how to do that.